Hi everyone, welcome to this fortnightly Talks of Frontline staff session. Um, we've got sort of one theme today for the meeting, which is uh, we've been joined by some of our uh, academics who are working us working with us um, from the universities of Hull and Sheffield, who have been looking at evaluating the uh, impact of the household support funds, which the council and our partners have been delivering. So uh, I'm going to pass over to Ben. So yeah, Ben, take it away, please. Hi, it's nice to meet you all. So I'm just going to share uh, a presentation. John will take over the first bit, and then I'll sort of follow up with some of the more detailed bits about the work that we're doing. But John's going to give you an introductory overview. Can you tell me if you can see this yet? Yeah, it's just loaded. Yeah, we can see it now. Yeah. OK, excellent. I'll just share it. John, if you just want to tell me when you want me to skip slides, because I can't see anybody else. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you, Ben. Um, I don't usually have somebody doing my slides for me. It's a real treat. Um, I feel important now. Um, thank you very much for coming along and letting us join your meeting. Um, you will have possibly come across us at various other points in time. Either one of my various research team will have been nagging you to get you to come onto a focus group or be chasing you for sharing case study data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and what we thought would be really good today was just to give you a bit of an idea of of what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're approaching it and some of the tools that we think um, have a real value in this this space um, and what we really are after is your thoughts your experiences and also to get while we've got you in one place to get your experiences of, of how the, the process is, is going around the household support fund but more broadly around how you see sort of collaborative working around poverty prevention developing over time can you slip to the next slide, Ben? Is it on the next slide for everybody? No, not for me. No. Oh, for some reason. It's it's just now, yeah. Maybe if you go to sort of um, go into the actual presentation mode, then you can. OK, that, that's probably fine. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, so. Uh, what do we do? Um, we do a range of things. We, we've been working in largely a broad area of um, cross-sectoral collaboration and engagement, looking at how and where, when we work together, we come up with better outcomes. And it, it's been a, a theme that we've worked on for a number of years. Uh, we did a program with DCMS many years ago called Enabling Social Action, which looked at what were the barriers to working better together and how could we overcome them. Um, then we did a big project during COVID-19, looking at how communities responded really effectively and, and why community-driven and community-led sort of led support made a massive difference during the crisis. Um, and we're continuing that work through the cost of living crisis to look at you know, how we using some of those skills to, to build a, a response to, to poverty and to, to try and look at instead of just looking at constant crisis support how do we move away from crisis support towards something that actually starts to move people and doesn't just keep just managing to keep them afloat without actually moving them any further um we're a bit of an odd research team in some respects um many would say because as academics we are very much um hands-on in terms of we want what we do to have an impact on the ground rather than just go in an academic journal and sit there and, and nobody read it for years so all of the work we do is focused upon using the skills, the methods, the, t the different tools that we develop to sort of work with, with partners and say, what are you trying to evidence? What are you trying to capture? And how can we help you to get that across? And in an area like prevention, this is really important because it, one of the big things that stops people investing in preventative strategies and preventative ways of working is this question mark over, well, how do we know it's making a difference? How do we know it has an impact? Now, all of us probably on this screen knows that it makes a difference. We know that prevention works, but it is really difficult to evidence it and prove it. And so what we've been trying to do is, is find ways in which we can work with places to, to find a way to evidence this work, but also evidence it in a way that doesn't mean that everybody's spending all their life collecting data and trying to provide evidence rather than actually doing the things that make the difference in the first place. So as the slide says there, we, we use a range of different tools and methods, and Ben's going to talk about some of these today. Um, but one of the things that we really have worked on is to look at how these things work at different levels across the service system, within the community, and also at the level of the individual. 
And by looking at the processes across all three levels, we think we start to get a clearer picture of what is happening, why prevention works in certain ways, and how we can evidence those processes moving forward. A key part of this is what we've called the strength-based model. Um, it sounds very flash, um, and we have some lovely infographics, but we are, we're not going to share those with you today because it, it's time intensive. Um, but underlying what, we, what we're trying to do is um, we start from the individuals. We start from people in their lives. And we think it's really important if you're going to understand how people end up sort of presenting with need for support that you don't just start from that presenting issue because in many cases that presenting issue is one of a complex range of pressures one of a complex range of challenges that people are facing and if you start from that and you go along a what is a very traditional linear line of issue presented activity we do and then whether or not we've solved the problem you miss a lot of the complexity of what's happening for those individuals so we've started upon focusing on the individuals and understanding their lives. So we've, we do a lot of work around p letting people tell us about their lives and how they've got to the point they're at. Um, and within that work, what we've really understood is that the context in which people live is really significant to understanding what's happening for them. And in particular, understanding how different pressures and different sort of pressures on individuals coming at individual system and community level can lead people into a situation where they suddenly feel they can't cope they lead them into crisis where one thing falls on top of the other and and they start to build up and people feel that they're they're in a, in a situation where they're no longer able to cope if we start to work from that sort of perspective it allows us to really sort of look at what are the pressures and opportunities um, across those different levels and how do these interact rather than looking at them as individuals how do those different things those different challenges interact with each other and how can we create a more joined up response so that a person and we, we you have all heard this many times people saying that they have to go in about 20 different points of entry to get their support because they have a lot of different issues getting bounced around the system it's time intensive for the individual it's also resource intensive for the organizations so how do we create something that is much more interactive and more joined up and how can we build support mechanisms that work what we call in the spaces in between often what, the, what happens is that people get lost in the system because they fall through the cracks because there is a gap between what the community organizations can support and how they need to refer into the SIS service system. There's a gap between the service system and the community group, so they're not interacting as well as they could be. The individual might not know what support is available to them at either level. They might be new to an area and not know what's out there in the community. So in many cases, that space is really important. So our research really focuses on how do we join those spaces in between where people get lost. and what we're trying to do in terms of evidencing is, is we, as we say, we come from a strengths-based approach, so we're not looking at it from a deficits angle of somebody has a problem and, and we're trying to solve a problem. If you look at people's lives, a lot of the issues that underlie it are not issues that can be solved overnight. We looked at a number of people in a study of local area coordination, and we, we talked to lots of people about their context in which they came to, to get support. And what we saw was actually the underlying conditions were things like people were transitioning into older age, or people were living with a mental or physical health condition, or they'd faced a sudden trauma in their lives that had radically shifted where they were and how they were living. Those were the things that they were dealing with, and the triggers were coming in, and, and new pressures were coming up them because of those things. We can't prevent people getting older. We can't prevent people from having some of these issues. So how then do we start to look at it if we can't prove that we've solved something? And what we've done is look at it from a strengths-based angle and say, well, how does support help people to build up insulation, insulators against some of those pressures? How do we help them to create a situation where they have the strength to, to respond to the challenges or they know where they need to go for help or they know how to get connections so that when those pressures come, they are better able to what we call bounce back? respond to those pressures, are better able to cope to those pressures so it doesn't push them into a crisis. So that's our logic behind what we do. Um, and we've been working with um, a number of locations. We did a big study on local area coordination for the last couple of years, results of which have just come out now. Um, but also we've been working with a number of different local authorities looking at crisis 
prevention, poverty prevention, using this sort of framework to sort of start to say, right, if we start from here, how can we collect data that helps you to show who the cohort are you're working with, what actions you're doing, and then how we evidence that those actions are actually making a difference to the individuals you're working with. So that's my very brief bit, and I apologize for the croaky voice because I've come down with a terrible cold, um, and I've done two presentations today, my voice is running out. So I'll hand over to Ben, who's going to take you through some of the different bits and pieces we've been doing in Hackney. Okay, thanks, John. So <clears throat> in order to get to a way to actually understand the situation in Hackney, in order to put it towards that model and understand, as John sort of talked about, these triggers, and the crisis points and what effective support looks like we're studying how hackney operates and how the people are supported and what that looks like here and in order to do that <coughs> apologies i think i'm coming down with what john's got even though i'm nowhere near him um it'll involve research across the whole system community and the individual level so it's all right talking about that in the abstract but what does that mean in practice so realistically what it involves is four different avenues of research so there's dashboard data case studies focus groups with teams and participant journeys and as john mentioned uh, i themselves harriet or katie who's in the meeting with us today it might have been sort of trying to get in touch with some of you here today to talk about maybe focus groups or participant journeys and i'm going to talk to you about these four different avenues of research and sort of give you a bit more understanding about what they are and what we'll gain from them. So with the dashboard data, we're working with the data team in Hackney Council and just to basically try and understand what data is collected by the system as a whole. So how's that broken down? How's it collected by different services? And in that, it's not just about understanding what is and what isn't collected, but also understanding whether what's being collected is actually worth being collected because over years and years you get all these legacy systems and we input certain data because we've always done it that way but what you find is that particularly in these environments where people like yourselves are having to deliver frontline support with big backlogs and less and less time for yourself some of those things that you're reporting on aren't really of use to many people and some things that you're under reporting on are really useful so it's about understanding what there is out there and we can also begin to build a bit of a profile about the certain impacts of the hsf over certain groups over these periods of times so that's some big sort of top level data for us to sort of sit and look at and delve into there but the case this is where the now we sort of move on to the bits which involve uh people like yourself so the case study data is something that we've uh, designed in collaboration with a couple of members of hackney council to sort of ask questions that we want to understand about your experience and the experience of people you've been supporting as well as some questions that hackney themselves want to know about it and what these do even though it's a bit of a snapshot of a case it gives us a bit of a understanding about the impact of service beyond those basic outcomes like john sort of talked about those underlying issues so rather than person presented needing food gave food person happy it's it's starting to try and dig down a bit into well how's that person come into their come into you guys needing food maybe what is their needs is it is that brought on by something else because most of the time that might be related to things like debt or uh, in arrears with council tax or numerous other issues could be mental health conditions that limit them being able to work or being able to afford food but when we just understand as service provided we lose that information but the other thing that this begins to give us an understanding for is is how effective and collaborative the system is in, in and of itself and it's not about putting blame on saying oh these this group are ineffective at providing support compared to this group it, because that whole system has to speak to one another and connect to one another and it's about trying to understand what's enabling you guys to offer the fantastic support you do but at the same time what's preventing you from taking that to the next level that's out of your control so based on what we've got so far from the case studies is the there were only 24 when we pulled the first batch from it we're hoping to get over 100 because that would begin to give us a much better picture but what we can sort of see is that the findings as more entered 
give us a picture of both what sort of cases are coming in. So does that trend change over time, as well as what forms of support are given and how. And we can actually get a picture of what residents in Hackney are experiencing beyond those presenting issues. And it also helps build an understanding then of what underlying issues are often found together with certain presenting issues, whether support's merely tidying them over, or as some people in focus groups are saying, is something just a stick in plaster until it moves on to the next week where that same support's needed, or is there some support that's been given that's more longer term impact? And are those related in specific instances? What we can also see is what patterns of where referrals are leading to and when more pressure has been put and if the right level of support from other organisations to them is, is there as well to support that pressure that's been placed. So in this instance, you can see that a lot of referrals for out from groups are actually going to members of the VCFS who might who we need to then understand through the focus groups is to how they're experiencing that extra pressure that's been put on them and how they feel that support's done. But it also helps us understand how and why certain support is or isn't as effective as it can possibly be given through an understanding of barriers and enablers. And this is kind of what John was hinting at earlier as well in the fact that we're here to help support positive change. We're not here to sort of go and evaluate people's jobs or how worthwhile their work is that they're doing what we want to understand is really what's limiting you guys from being the best that you can be that's that's outside your control so so far in this what we've sort of seen is that barriers to that effective support is unsurprisingly which is seen across the nation because various sorts of costs is lack of budget but then there's also been some hints about poor collaboration and communication between teams or a lack of a system knowledge and support being needed outside of scopes of services. So it begins to give us a bit of an insight as to how well the system speaks to each other. And it begins to give us an opportunity to then discuss with Hackney ways that we can say, okay, is there a way to sort of help increase system knowledge amongst people in the service sector? So that's one side of it. And then the other two strands are the ones that involve us sitting around and doing a lot of talking to either yourselves or to people who've sort of been experiencing the support. And with the focus groups, as I've sort of mentioned that Harriet or Katie might have been in touch with you about, based on what I just said, that it's not about that, it's not about coming in and evaluating you. It's about coming in and really trying to get to grips and understand your experience of delivering support through the HSF and how that impacts your wider support delivery and we want to consider what enables the support that you give to happen what limits it from being more effective and so rather than the very small brief sections in that case study where you get maybe a line or two to answer that this gives us a space of an hour to an hour and a half to really sort of unpack and understand from your experience what those barriers are what impact it has on you uh, how it impacts the work within your team how it impacts the people that you support but the important thing about it is is that we're hearing it from you because at the end of the day as john said we we want to get involved we don't just want to sit and write an academic paper and and leave it on a shelf by getting involved it allows us to get you to be the experts to tell us what's happening we're we're not coming through to Hackney and sort of saying, oh, we know how this works because we worked in other local authorities. We want to really understand it from the perspectives of yourselves. So if, if Harriet or Katie get in touch with about focus groups, this is what we're trying to do. It's this, it's a safe space where when it's written up and any analysis is done, all names will be completely abstracted. It'll anyone who says anything that we quote would literally be referred to as something like focus group three member and that'd be it so there'd be no way of knowing a specific voice so it's all about trying to make sure that you feel comfortable and safe in that environment to help us understand what this experience is like and then the participant journeys is a similar thing it's much safe space and trying to get the people who've been supported to be the experts to share their journey with us <clears throat> and so we want to understand their experience of their life really and what's brought them into needing support what's brought them into that crisis moment help really build out that contextual experience of their life and what those triggers that they're facing is and then understand that this what the support that they've received from the hsf or organizations is 
and what that support looks like and the impact that it's had on the lives and really by getting to speak to the people what we get is we don't just get a quantitative aspect of oh it's provided me with relief for three weeks or it's provided me with a new uh, settee or something like that what we really get is to understand how that's affected their mental health how that's affected their life their pride their their ability to feel comfortable safe and things like that and it really helps us understand that individual level and helps connect up these other different avenues that we've been looking at and off the back of that participant journey i i've, I've been sort of asked to just try and we're, we're coming down to london to hackney on the 5th and 6th of june and we're looking for some more people to fill up some space in those days for participant journey interviews and what we do, what we'd really need is that if anybody is willing to be able to speak to anybody that they support that they think might be a good person for us to speak to what we'd hope is that you could maybe get in touch with Katie or Harriet and what it would require is we would need a sort of private space at your location so the reason we want your location is because oftentimes these people are vulnerable and the last thing we want them to do is to say right come and meet us who you've never met before travel x number of miles across hackney even though we pay for the taxi it's about making sure they're in an environment that they feel comfortable and safe in and by you sort of bridging us and connecting us with them it sort of facilitates that trust forward it would take about an hour of their time for us, for them to speak to us and they'd also get a 20 pound voucher for taking part so if if any of you groups or guys have an organ have any events on on those days that you think i know three or four people who might be worth uh, speaking to or would be willing to give up some of their time for us then that'd be really appreciated because the more people that we can fill in these participant journeys the more that we can fully begin to understand their lived experience and so the big question is because you're all working these intense roles out on the front line and sort of going, all right, well, somebody else is coming in and coming to look at us. What, what, what are we gaining from it? And John sort of spoke a bit about it at the beginning, but, but what we hope to sort of leave Hackney with is a better understanding of what this money's had on them and whether it's been delivered in the right way and what, were, what are the lessons to be learned that can be improved upon and it's a clear so that's understood through a clear picture of those enablers and those blockers and the tools and data collection methods will be left behind as well to help continue to gather relevant data because as john sort of mentioned we've worked in these other places and we've seen that they've collected lots and lots of data that's irrelevant a lot of the times so what and the it's about important that we make sure that we're collecting and that Hackney continue to collect the right things, that's not a burden on your job, that's not going to add another five, 10, 20 minutes onto your role in a day. But how do we actually remove that burden and try and lessen it, make it more streamlined, make it more quicker? And of course, we'd be lying if we didn't say that we don't get something out of this at the end of the day as well. So for us, we get this chance to sort of look at Hackney in comparison to others to help continue our research onto prevention in local authorities across the country and it enables us to continue testing out this model that John sort of spoke about against what we find in Hackney and it also allows us to continue to develop and finesse these tools because as we've developed these tools and started leaving them behind in various local authorities they've always got to be nuanced and sort of twisted and tweaked to what a specific need is and the more that we do that, the more that we understand how different areas will also benefit by smaller, minor tweaks. And I think that's all I've got here. So I'm going to stop sharing these slides and I'll stop waffling and I'll let somebody either speak or ask any questions. Thanks, Ben and John. Um... Penny, do you want to come in? You've also put uh, an offer in the chat, but yeah, do you want to come in? Yeah, so Ben, um, it's, that's all great, and, and hopefully it will save us a lot of time if if that's all put in place. So it's a breath of fresh air to hear that. I'm sick of filling out forms, obviously. I, I'm sure everyone is. <laughs> obviously, we're still going to have to do that, but 
if for example we did get a group of beneficiaries together um would would we personally have any part to play in the interview question or would you just come and spend that hour with them we wouldn't have to take part in that we'd hand it over to you yes yeah, so it'd be the idea is is that we'd enter into a private room with just just one of them and one of us the reason we don't want on one is because because often when there's a group of people they might not necessarily feel safe to open up about yeah. certain bits of information and we also talk them through the university ethics because we're university in uh, research we have certain ethics that we have to abide by as well so we make sure that they understand that they're fully in control so any questions they don't mm. want to discuss they can sort of say no if they wanted to yeah. any interview any point they can tell us that if they want to say I want this everything that I've said scrubbed and thrown in the bin then yeah. it's all their control so it's all about setting that safe environment where they can just sort of be open with us as much as they're willing yeah. to be for us to so sort for of... example if you don't get the and that's great so if you don't get the data that you were hoping from that one participant do they still get the 20 pounds for participating <laughs> as, yeah. as soon as they enter yeah. that room and they sit down with us there and then they're giving up their time and it's it's given to them there yeah because it is hard to get that type of information and i agree that the the questions that we get asked on some grant reporting uh, forms it can be sort of irrelevant because when when asking them questions how did it how did it help you it's like oh yeah it's great i got my 25 pound shopping help me for that week and then it's elaborating on that isn't it so a lot of people don't want to expand onto that and they don't really yeah. talk naturally about the mental health and go deeper it's not like a, a a natural conversation to have is it so i get that you'd need the private room for that so yeah, yeah that'd so, be good. To give you an idea penny one of the sorry ben I've, I've jumped in um the the team have been working on this way of working for quite a while now we've, we've done it on a number of different projects and it does take a, a bit of time and skill really? to to learn to to engage and share with people and it, yeah. it sometimes it involves a bit of sharing on our side as well and talking about our own personal experiences in our lives and it doesn't start from oh you received this voucher or tell us about when you received this voucher it starts yeah. from just tell us about yourself where yeah. did you come from how come you're in hackney and so it allows them just to talk about their lives really yeah. and that way we've found you get to the point you need to get to because people can tell you their life in the way they want to tell it to you rather than you sitting there saying okay we want to know about this 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 and this yeah we don't do it that way we just let them tell the story and, and you're asking open questions, questions and stuff rather than the close yeah. questions yeah. and all in skills yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So it might yeah. Go that, it might go that i might go after a bit when we've been talking about their experience in hackney and sort of the life they're in i might say something like oh so how did you meet penny and then we sort of naturally build out the conversation from there and it sort of fills in the, the the skill is for us to work out how to get to these things without asking blunt questions through the conversation yeah yeah that makes sense and the reporting is did, did i miss it at the start is this just for the household support fund did you say or is it shared just in general with hackney council for everything did i miss that bit at the start when you said that sorry it's it's a broader process we um the target was a household support fund because there was a, a logic within the, the funding thing um the reason we've linked up with hackney is because they were part of a broader project for the department of leveling up housing and communities called partnerships for people and place and um, we'd been involved in in that program and we wanted to see how some of the collaborative ways of working in Hackney were being developed and taken forward, and especially given the sort of cost of living crisis, how can we use some of these collaborative ways of working to to move forward and engage some of this process? So, while the household support fund is a part of it, we really want to look beyond that to say, what do we do to to take this further? You know, we can't just keep bailing people out in a crisis support model. We have to start to say, well, what's next? Mm. and and how we want to use your expertise and your knowledge to say well what is it that hackney's doing that's trying to move that forward mm. and how do you prove to people because yeah let's face facts money's not going to get any more sort of available to us all and and it's going to be constantly a battle to get funding so the more we evidence the impact the more chance we've got of keeping that going mm. so it's about saying how do we understand what you do why it works and then provide you with an evidence base that puts that in front of people and doesn't just tell one story but tells a, a combined set of stories and a combined set of data that backs up what you're trying to say
That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, John and Ben. Can I just pick up on something that Katie's put in the chat as well, in case people haven't seen it? And thanks for that, Katie. That's important to know. Um, <clears throat> we have both men and women on the research team. So in certain spaces where uh, maybe men are excluded or women are excluded for either face-based reasons or any other sorts of reasons, we have uh, both men and women on the research team who can go into those spaces that sort of doesn't overstep the boundaries of what people are comfortable. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, and thanks for your questions as well, Penny. If you don't mind, I'll I'll sort of introduce you guys via email as well, in case you do want to um, link Ben and John in with some of the residents you work with. That would be really good. Um, Charlie, your hand popped up a couple of times. I didn't know if you still wanted to come in or not. It was more just a kind of comment to say, this is really what I can really see the value and how this is hugely appreciated. I've had conversations with lots of partners, Penny included, about this is exactly what we need to do and how we need to tell the story. And it articulates it in a way that I've struggled to find myself and it's really nice to be, to hear it voiced and in a way that, you know, just to hear it all out. So thank you. Yeah, agreed. Um, does anyone else have any ideas or suggestions or feedback or thoughts on uh, the work that's going to take or is taking place? Uh, Hannah. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So, um, it's not directly related to John and Ben's research, but to the way the data is collected for the program um for hsf like i understand it's like from the government department that is imposed and they put markers they want to um map out the beneficiaries and there's like one marker per person per household so like disabled household dependents unemployed but the people that we are helping they have like all the markers <laughs> so that shows how vulnerable they are and in our reports and i raised it with charlotte as well um we uh i put like the the, the data by the percentages and all has to adapt to 100 percent of course and i put the data how the department wants and then on the side i've done the real data uh to show that those markers are multiplied so you know it's not it's not the same like if you have all the five markers that's like a really dire situation you've got two disabled uh, people in the household one unemployed and you also have a uh, minor dependent so um just to raise it up like uh, since you will be presenting your your research uh, higher up and to state stakeholders that there is an there's an issue that people on the ground are not the same with how they envisage about collecting this data. I know if you have some comments yourselves on that. Can I come in, John, quickly and respond to Hannah? Yeah, I get sure. exactly what you're saying, Hannah, and it is is a constant challenge. This is why we're saying we, we, we want to move away from those traditional linear models where so, because someone's presented with one issue, that is the issue. You know, it's the world is not, we, you know, we don't work in that nice, neat way. Our lives aren't nice and linear. We don't have a problem one day it's solved and then we never have a problem again. You know, if you talk to people, their lives go up and down in, in waves. And it's how, how do we understand how the support we're giving helps them to deal with the next wave of challenge or how does that support help them to, to deal with one aspect that then eases the burden on other aspects. So. If you look in isolation, you miss the whole point. And this is what we're trying to get people to see. Um, it's not easy because it doesn't fit into nice, neat boxes and spreadsheets for people. But part of what we're doing with the, the case study um, form that we're encouraging people to utilize is to try and capture that. So we sort of say, well, what other issues are they coming with? What other things are being presented with? How are you referring people on? And it's, it's not just in, in Hackney that this is a challenge. You know, we've worked in other places where the dashboard data simply can't even tell where the person comes in and whether or not they come in at three or four or five places within the system, whether it's VCS, whether it's uh, local authority, they can't track anybody. And if you don't know their journey through, how do you know you're having the right impact in, in the work you're doing? So we're completely with you on it. And as Ben said, you know, it, it's about, for us, it's, it's, it's also we have to learn from you guys. So, so where these things aren't working or where you think there's a challenge within that system, 
we really want to hear about it. We really want to hear about what what you're battling with with that and, and how you think some of these things could be done better. Great, thanks, John. Um, Charlotte? Yeah, hi, I just wanted to come in um, and thank Hannah um, for uh, share, sharing that report. I had a few um, from different partners also, so if you're on the call and kindly provided a report for the most recent household support funding, I have collated them all, I've saved them all um, to feed into the research as well, because I know the monitoring form is very, uh, it's quite restrictive in some aspects, so I have kept hold of all of those, and hopefully alongside this research, we can build up a better, sort of bigger picture of what's actually happening, um, and feed that back to Department of Work and Pensions as well. They're also interested in this run um, to see any evaluations that go on. So we'll have their attention for that. Thanks, Charlotte. And yeah, they were quite receptive, weren't they, when they met with us at the end of the last round of HSF. Um, they were very sort of interested to hear about the work we're doing under HSF. So um, yeah, hopefully we can continue those those conversations. Um, Charlie, did you want to come in? I I, re I was. I had, Hannah, I had a question of Hannah, then I realised I replied by email, which was just that if when you're submitting any information to us as well, I'd be interested in whatever you, data that you're collecting and however you're collecting it. Um, I think I said that in the email that I sent to Hannah, but I just I just read it to double check and it's fine. So yeah. Cool. <clears throat> nice one, thanks, Charlie. Um, just looking in the chat, JC has written. Did you want to come in, or I, I can just. Uh read it out uh hi, i don't mind yeah no it's just it was a just a little useful tool we've lost where if you were on the phone to someone and they had it came about with a lockdown and that if they had several different problems then you could click on and it would like food or groceries and it would come up with all options for them and then you could click on that and it would make an email to go out to them with all the details because what I find difficult is like I deal with people with lots of different problems and I refer, refer to different places it's knowing everything that's, there's so much out there it's about knowing what's out there so a, a central database would be useful anyway but we lost it because the new phone system doesn't support it apparently mm. That's interesting to know. I, I don't what... know if that's. Yeah. Because yeah. I went to use it yesterday and it's like, oh, it's gone. <laughs> right. So, uh, and the uh, texting options as well. So, yeah. yeah we, in a different meeting today, me and Charlie were talking about, um, mm. yeah, community partners wanting to residents to be able to like, indicate on the phone call, like, which needs they have so it flags up for the council staff so it's a similar similar sort of issue um yeah. yes i think it was better conversations charlie um That's it, conversations yeah i thought i'd put it in sorry penny uh i thought plinth was going to be great if all local organizations were to use it for navigating and referring but it seems happening not going ahead to support i don't know what plinth is so someone else is going to have to come in and answer that um, one I'll come in, Penny. I don't know either. I know Abby was looking at it a while back um, as part of the kind of conversations with the food network mm. and the food partners. Um, I think we need to check in there around how that's going. If it was, it was going to go ahead, for example, it's a platform, and I've got no affiliation with them. I'm not trying to sell it to everyone, by the way, because I thought it was a breath of fresh air when it was presented to us through a Hackney call, right? It was they presented it on one of the was it uh, was a food network call a few network calls. Calls. Yeah. yeah and then we had a separate presentation offline from that and it all, i was like it's free to use brilliant and you can see local organizations you can keep track of your referrals you can store um beneficiaries data on there and track how you keep in touch with them and what you've been doing and then refer internally and share information and you can also see um data on um geographical data and things like that can't you but if not if people don't get on board then it's not going to work internally but not also that when you do a drop down box for boroughs involved Camden's on there but Hackney's not so if Hackney doesn't get on board with that it's not going to really work is it and I think they need the funding from Hackney to do that 
Yeah, the way that Plinth works is it requires central funding for the local authority and then organisations can then join in. We'll, I'll check in with Abby about where that conversation's got to. And but we'll it is update. free to use and it's going to be good for organising, so between monday.com and that, I'll, I'll try to start inputting the stuff on, but I don't want to waste my time inputting data and using it if not everyone else is going to get on board with that. But it would be good for um, seeing local organisations on there and what's out there, because you can... You can share, spread the word of what you do and see what others do and then obviously refer internally on there. I'll do some digging, Penny, and get back to you on that. Yeah. Thanks, Penny. And uh, welcome, Jenny. You've just joined us. Not sure if you're able to come in or not, but yeah, welcome. Um, does anyone else have any questions or feedback about the research that Ben and John and team are doing? I was going to ask if based on the work you've already undertaken are there sort of um specific uh groups of residents or specific um sort of needs that you're that you can see there's a gap in terms of the knowledge that you're building from the work that you've already done are there particular sort of community organizations or health partners etc that you'd be keen to speak to don't take this john I think I think it's as many as possible is is the is the easiest sort of way to answer for a couple of reasons. So when you get into the VCS sector, what you have is so many people doing overarching projects, but they also have those who are coming into very sort of niche groups and target demographics. And the information and learning from both of those forms of organizations are incredibly valuable. And the other aspect and the reason to get to know as many as possible is because we've done projects in London, we've done projects in Greater Manchester, we've done projects all over and, and every single area has different socio-demographic makeup. So anything that we sort of take in those areas can't always be reproduced and understood to be the exact same in another location. So it's always the importance of understanding in Hackney. So for this project, it's the understanding of in Hackney, how are those different how are those different groups experiencing it themselves rather than trying to say oh in the north of england it's this so it must be the same in hackney does that make sense john sounded good to me ben um just to sort of add in a sense it it, it comes back to the, the way in which we're approaching this i mentioned earlier about this the three layers of, of working at the, the individual layer at the voluntary and community sector and the communities themselves layer and then at, at the service system layer and we've really found in, in all the work we've done that where these things work well is when there's something that is able to bridge those different layers where we have systems that can we call it boundary spanning if you like um, people who can sit in those spaces we've got sitting in the spaces in between because so often that's where connections get lost because sometimes the service system can't reach down far enough because it struggles to access certain communities or the trust isn't there with those communities to go up back into the system and the community groups and the community organizations are able to build that bridge and connect that process similarly sometimes individuals just don't know what's out there both in terms of the services and what sort of port they can access but also if you're new to an area how do you know what community organizations are on your doorstep how do you make that first step into a community organization it's not easy to to join something if you're feeling under pressure if you're feeling stressed and your mental health isn't great it's a massive jump so looking at the ways in which people are pulled into that community support and then how those different connections bridge those processes is, is really what we're trying to capture because my instinct is it's the network that works it's the collaboration that works and i said we, we did a big project during covid and i think covid was a point at which we really saw this happening really successfully you know we we had to deliver something with limited resources and we made the most of the resources that were available to us and everybody pulled together by actually wrapping around what was already there by actually allowing people the permission to act because they knew that they knew what they were doing and i think we sometimes as we've gone back into crisis mode again and the resources are less and, and the pressure is more we've sort of lost some of that thinking about actually how do we allow people permission to get on and do what they do well and how can we bring that in to make that collaboration work so, so we are really trying to to capture some of that space so the more organizations and the more different 
communities and especially those communities who often get missed within the system. If you feel that you're working with one of those communities who, who really don't trust the system or they, they just don't connect, it, finding out how you work with them to be able to bring them into that space would be really useful to us. Great, thanks, John. You've kind of already answered my next question, but um, I was just going to like ask from your research that you've done in other areas, like what what is the sort of emerging best practice in making sure residents, community partners, everyone in the system is aware of what's out there? Because we discuss it a lot in this meeting and other places around, and you know, instinctively, you know, it's quite easy to think there's a sort of um, you know, a quick fix, obviously there isn't. And we talk a lot about, you know, do we need one website that lists everything or is it more about, you know, multiple different comms routes? You know, do, do you have any sort of emerging best practice around this space from the research that you've done? Um, I can give you one example that comes from the work we've done with local area coordination teams in four different local areas. Um, and one of the big themes that came out of, of why local area coordination worked so well was people describe the support they gave as people being there. And it, it sounds really simplistic, but people were more confident that they could cope if they knew that there was someone there if they needed it. They Half the time they didn't need it. They were able to cope for themselves. They had the confidence they'd been helped through that process to get the confidence to deal with things for themselves. But that knowledge that there's someone they can go to who is in and of the community, but also connected into the local authority gave them the strength to be able to feel that they could cope. And I think, you know, local area coordination is quite distinctive because it's a distinctive model. Um, it's a distinctive funding thing. But what makes it distinctive is because staff are given time to work in the community. They're given time to spend in community groups. And they're, yes, they're local authority based, but a lot of their time is out in the community, finding out how they can support community organizations to get funding, how they can work with individuals to connect them in. But it allows that connection. I, I don't think you can do it without individuals. I have to say relationships. We were in a, another presentation the other day with the Department of Health, and the thing that came out was relationships make the difference. And you can't do it without relationships because people don't trust a, a, a website or a doorway. They trust a person and, and they learn. You can't explain your 20 different issues 20 times every time you knock on and uh, ring up a, a thing, press one, and then you have to start again. You know, but if you know that someone's been sat with you, you don't have to go back because they know your history, they know the process. That just opens up a door. And I think just adding on to what John said, that the same is true for the relationship between the voluntary community sector and the local authority in the sense of there's no real sort of quick fix of putting together a website that can just have all details listed on there because you've still got the issue of is that information being spread around to enough people? Do people know those sorts of things? It's the longer term relation building between those different groups and those sectors that actually facilitates that, oh, I don't know anything about that, but I know somebody who will know. And it's that connection and that community that actually makes that difference rather than having a prescriptive list sort of set out somewhere. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, Josie said, I think if someone has a designated person to see them through their journey to help connect them a long term to enable them how to take control of themselves. Yeah, I completely agree. I guess one of the challenges is when things are based on, to put it bluntly, things are based on relationships, what happens when people leave an organisation? And if they if they build up a relationship with a resident that's, you know, been quite long term, um, or if it's relationships between organisations, between the council and a community partner or, or whatever it might be, it's about maybe how you can solidify that system-wide rather than just be based on person to person. But yeah, it's a quite a tricky one to solve, I guess. Um, we've got a few hands up. Uh, Charlie. I was just going to say the relationship thing is kind of, that's interesting to hear that that's where it's kind of happening universally because I think that's where lots of our instincts lies i think that's where my instinct lies but yeah equally i share john's concern about when it's centered in people's roles because people move on people it's an inevitable consequence um i don't i don't really have anything more to say other than it's reassuring to hear that the challenges are, you know, are seen across multiple local authorities not just in hackney and yeah thank you thanks charlie um penny and then josie it might be not a great suggestion or it might have already been done for over the years from 2020 so i'm not too sure um but 
all the mapping out that we've done since lockdown um for someone who's got the knowledge of all the networks uh, all the organizations it would be good to have someone connect like just say for idiots for example and the surrounding organizations to us who offer different services to be connected where like idiots offer food and then a few other different areas such as like data bank and um no recost public funds grants and um whatever grants we've been applied for at the time being successful with what we can offer to be connected to other organizations so we can then refer backwards and forwards and have a separate group chat just so we can we can between us all offer overall all-round holistic support so overall like just just say there's four organizations in one little pocket of an area like someone like charlie because he's great at doing it putting us all together in a whatsapp group and saying right overall holistically you can all offer one resident with these issues you from start to end you can all refer into each other and it would work in geographically where you are um because we're quite spread across the borough because obviously one resident doesn't want to travel right across the other end of hackney to get help so it would work if it's in the same pocket of an area does that make sense yeah no it does yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to explain yeah, no, no, it makes total sense. I think it's that balance between things growing quite organically with smaller mm -hmm. organisations, but then having some layer of kind of planning and kind of alignment in terms of what's needed locally. And knowing what, um, exactly what they offer, like not yeah. just food or just this, just that. And if it's different areas that might benefit that one resident could me for this, and then they go up there for that. And we can overall bounce around from them, different organisations. We're going to get overall a bit more help and then not need to rely so much on us, hopefully, in the future to give them the lift they need to then go off and not come back to us as much. Because that's what I, I'd love to see. I'd love to see where we don't have uh, customers coming back to us as much, like you say, and not be long standing two, three year uh, beneficiaries. Um, and then they move on in the life, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Penny. Um, Josie, did you want to come in? Yeah, I sort of, in my head, I've got, I mean, I like to have, I'd like to have something where everything is, because at the moment I do spend quite a lot of time Googling to try and find something in the area that might help people. And it would be really nice to just have somewhere I can go and think, right, they need help with this. We And the map thing was useful as well, because then you could pick and match places that are close to each other. But on the concept of, because, um, uh, like with tenancy stamp, I have to help them with lots of different things. I don't just look at their rent arrears. I look at if they, this will help them, that will help them, that. And then, like, I've got people that, that I've been dealing with for, like, 10 years that come back to me, uh, and I never turn them away because I'm too soft, but then I will try and find out where they need to go if, if it's not my issue anymore. And if someone had a person that they could come to that would guide them through that, so then if a new problem occurs they can go back to that person and say this 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 uh then you'd have that continuing dialogue and um also part of that what i try and do is i try and train people uh not in their face but surreptitiously to go out and do things themselves and when they do that they begin to feel really empowered and they come back to you less and less as well because they think oh i can i know where i've got to do now um and like you said john though if, if someone's been doing that and they leave then i guess we just have to make sure there's a proper handover period so they would get to know the new person before one left and the other came in so yeah thanks josie i think it's um oh john did you want to come I, in i was just going to follow up that that, that point about the it is an issue you know if you build up a relationship of trust with somebody how does that sort and it's something we looked at with local area coordination is well, what happens when the local area coordinator moves on um interestingly one thing with local area coordinators is they very rarely move on um in a world where um we have massive problems with retention of and getting staff in, in adult social care local area coordinators stay um it's, it's quite shocking how many of them stay in their posts and the reason they give when you talk to them is because this is what i always thought my job was about it's about people it's about connections and i love it and, and i'm not going to go and do anything else but there have been a lot, a number of examples where people have changed roles or they've moved to work in a different ward, and it's about managing that that process. Exactly what Josie was saying, managing a handover and managing almost if it's been done well, 
that one relationship becomes a number of relationships. It becomes a network because they have been introduced into a community organization. They've got other connections. They no longer need that one. And that's what, where we've seen the real success of something like local area coordination is that people saying, yes, I relied on this person to start, but now I don't really see them very often. I see them maybe once at a community cafe and I say hello, but I don't need them because I've got my own network and I know how to do these things and they've helped me get that confidence. So they sort of step back anyway. So I think it, it's about how you manage some of those relationships. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, Charlie? I, I'm conscious that some of the things we're speaking to speaks directly to what my job is about. So I thought I'd kind of say what that job is, which I think I haven't done maybe here for a while, and also put an open offer to anyone who feels they could be useful for them. So my job title is System Convener. And what that means in principle is I do have a sense of pride to have a sense of what's going on on the ground with lots of different organizations and try to have relationships with them. Someone like Penny will be tired of me calling her about different things to try and find out this kind of information. So if there is a linking of specific things to if people want to be linked into around their local area, I can definitely look at my my Rolodex, which mostly sits in my head, unfortunately, so it's not something I can share hugely <laughs> to anyone in the network but i can share my time so if anyone does want to have a chat with me about things or services in a particular area or for example with penny like in your service provision if there's something that it is isn't doing that you want to understand it's happening locally elsewhere like for example i know that you were chatting to daniel last week at this call and daniel has skyway as an organization that operates also in the south of the borough looking at youth provision i'm i can facilitate those links and that's what i'm here for so please just get in touch with me if anyone wants that kind of thing generally it's it's what i'm for so please take advantage nice one thanks charlie um does anyone have any other things they want to share or questions they want to ask john and ben or anyone else about this research i was just going to ask you guys um are all, are all elements of the research still carrying on? So the focus groups, the case study form, the participant journeys, they're all sort of ongoing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if it was, as well as the participant journeys that we've sort of asked about uh, people getting involved and getting in touch with us about that, I've left a few email uh, addresses in the chat as well about that. Um, the focus groups are also ongoing and the wider sort of groups that we get to speak to about in the focus groups is always better so if anybody's interested in taking part that's not been contacted yet by the KTUs here or Harriet um, then or myself then please just get in touch because what we try and do is we try and make sure we match up people in focus groups so we wouldn't necessarily put people from the local authority with people from the VCS sector in the same focus group so we can have that shared knowledge and sort of ability to discuss what it's like being part of this sector versus what it's been part of that sector and, and again because we don't want to cut, be the cause of any strain of a relationship if we want to create a space where people can speak openly and honestly as well so we want to make it as open and free and as possible so please feel free to get in touch about aspects like that as well and uh, please fill out the case studies as well that Rachel Salmon I know has been sort of pushing forward those case studies are designed to take less than four minutes we're not asking you to fill one in every time you support somebody just two a week if everybody did two a week each it would provide us with so much things but yeah so still all ongoing just to just to follow up with what ben said there we we, we phrase it making stories count because stories as we all know make a massive difference you can get to people by telling them the stories of individuals but on their own they become anecdotes and people are easy easy to dismiss a, a, a story as just one person's experience so by having a regular case study framework and by having a frame in which we can encourage you to keep doing the same thing and you're all doing the same thing we can then take that we can code it we can analyze it and we can put that behind people's stories their individual stories and say yes this is a story but look how many other people are also experiencing the same thing so this is not just this person it's a regular pattern so it allows you to take that that depth of story and then 
build something more some would say quantitative i hate to to go down that road but it gives you something that's more substantive yeah it all makes sense thanks guys um also just to say i will include um the slides in the newsletter as well and i'll i'll put ben and john's email in the newsletter as well in case anyone's missed it so you'll have it there if you want to get in touch um i just can i just quickly yeah. say sure. josie says she's sent an email i added an extra r, r in harriet's surname josie so that'll be why you've had it oh, spent, but it'll be gone to Kate's okay own, i copied so and, i copied and pasted it from the chat so it must be wrong in the chat yeah right, right. <laughs> okay it's come through to me josie right, thank brilliant. you so yeah, if you, it was a suggestion, but I I can help if you want me to do a couple of things a week as well. <laughs> Amazing, thanks, Josie. Um, Hannah, um, I just wonder um, whether John and Ben have some advice on case studies. I haven't looked at your uh, surveys on the case studies yet, but I've done them for the previous program. Just like what we what we would have done our stories are often ones that are quite static and that's our success that we came the status quo and that doesn't look so impressive very often for funders and for case studies so do you have like an advice i mean what we do in our data in our service we ask what would life look like without Ms. Gaff's support and then we have like responses it would be a disaster i can't i can't imagine it and so on and that's nice from our carers of learning disabled women but again it, it's not like something that you had somebody who was in abject poverty and you you forwarded them to one agency and they managed to sort them down housing however it's not type of those stories which is which is a prevented crisis but it's much harder to to make it into some sort of epic story yeah i think this is this is one of the misnomers sometimes is that stories where people are made able to stay afloat stay the same are just as important as those who've made massive strides forward keeping people at the same point is is a massive achievement in many cases and we tend to always people are thinking well if i've got to report to a funder i've got to show exactly what you're saying hannah this story where i've i've done this work and then now they've jumped three stages further forward and they're amazingly able to cope with all these things but that's not the world most of us live in. And, and this is why the strengths-based model is, is different in a sense, because we're staying, people are juggling lots of things, you know, we're all of us juggling loads of different pressures and all the time, different things are trying to push us, they're trying to trigger us into to problems. And if any of you have been juggled, if, you, if you're any of your jugglers, you'll know that once you've dropped one ball, you don't carry on juggling. Once one goes, they all go. And what we've got to think about is, well, how do we keep people from having that push that means that they drop the ball? How do we keep it so that we are buffering them and defending them and insulating them from those pressures? They might not move forward particularly far. That might be the condition they're in. It might be the stage of their lives that they're in, and that's what they can cope with. But the key is that they're not going down and they're not falling into that crisis and they're not dropping those things that they're juggling. And if we can start to capture that, and if we can get people into a mindset that says this is a positive you know then we can we can say we we as i said earlier we, we use this notion of can people bounce back better so first time they hit a problem it might cause massive problems because it knocked it was the one thing that was the straw that broke the camel's back and knocked four or five different things over at the same time the next time because they've been built with support and they've, they've got themselves back on their feet the next time it happens are they able to respond better is the less of a collapse as a consequence of the things that have been put in place to me that's proper prevention that's that's building on the strengths of the individual to really be able to say no i can i can do this i can do this i don't need all those things or i know where to go when i need them so the more we can get that the more we can capture that ability to keep people afloat keep people on on course doesn't matter if they haven't moved forward don't panic that you haven't got this massive, amazing story to tell because telling them that you've kept them there is a massive story in itself. And I think just to add on to John, just to sort of help reinforce that, even if they have fallen back slightly, that's not necessarily a bad thing either because it's how far back have they slid compared to the time before. And it's what has that prevented them from getting, from having a worse experience than a previous time. So I always, I, I always remember one on, the local area coordination project about somebody who had uh, alcohol 
problems. And it was seen as a massive success that when they started drinking again, that they got in touch within a couple of weeks with a service to support them rather than leaving it six months, eight months, when the problem had got so worse, when it required so much intervention. They, they had the strength and the knowledge to know that I know who I can speak to and I don't have to be ashamed about getting this support. And even that's prevention. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Sean and Hannah. Um, yeah, Johnny's just made the point in the chat. More stories, the better. So, um, yeah, the, the the evidence that you've got on the ground is what we're what we're looking for in whatever sort of whatever shape it, it comes. It's all going to be be useful for making the case for this sort of work. So, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's got any other questions or or comments for Ben and John and Katie. We've got twenty minutes left. Um, but if not, we can move on. Um, ben, John, Kate, I don't know if you've got any final reflections, but um, thanks very much for coming along and facilitating this this session. I think it's been, been really useful to get um, an overview of all the great work you're doing and hopefully you've made some useful connections in this space as well. It's been brilliant. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting us along. And as, as we've said all the way along, if you think you've got something that's important to share, if you think you've got experiences that can feed in, just because we haven't, you haven't been on one of our lists, that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. It's just that we didn't know you were there and we haven't got your email or whatever. So please do contact us because everybody's perspective is important. Nice one. Thanks, John. Cool. Um, thanks, JC. That'd be great. Um, we've got, yeah, about quarter of an hour for 20 minutes left so we usually just wrap up this meeting with sort of an open space for people to ask a question or give a shout out to any uh, piece of work they're doing if, they, if anyone's got any particular program they think they want to promote to everyone else or they've got a, a question they want answering or a particular thorny issue that they're struggling with at the moment in their work now now's your chance to to come in so um Feel free to to come in if you've got anything you want to share or ask about. Josie. This is a bit of good news. I was really pleased with this. I managed to get about four parking tickets and fines written off for someone. <laughs> Something that will resonate with us all, I'm sure. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm sure that will actually have a massive impact for that person. So that's, well, that's, I thought I'm, that's yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to see if I can do it. And it happens. So always worth asking, isn't it? <laughs> what, what was the What was the trick? Or was it just <laughs> going just by the normal? Really. Yeah. <laughs> I just well, went to the market and I said this, this and this. And she's got a very low income. She's got three autistic kids. Da -de -da -de -da. And uh, they looked into it and they got back to me and said, OK, we'll write them off. Oh, nice <laughs> always worth asking. I always like seeing how far I can push things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being cheeky. Nice Thanks, <laughs> um, anyone else want to come in? Any other good news stories or concerns people have got? Things that people um, have had a problem with the last couple of weeks they want some help with? Uh, Ali? Yeah, it's, um, it's not kind of yeah it's a good news story um i went to shadow the money hub um i can't remember when it was charlie do you remember it was the 5th of december i was looking at the oh. notes yesterday <laughs> okay um i went on the 5th of december and um i presented which was great and then um the members of the um, money hub the officers just came and just did many presentations to me to say this is what we do blah 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 anyway from that we agreed that they would attend Caribbeats on a monthly basis and we've had our second visit and I've not got the exact figures but the first visit I had cantinas come back to me and say oh my god I've got a phone call and um, I'm old money or oh I've got these vouchers or, I've got this um, and I'm, I'm really trying to work out a system to see how much money's been saved or people have got back um, the last visit was just the two people attended, Maxine and Jenny, I mean, they didn't stop for a minute. Um, Councillor Bramble attended, and it, it, it was just a really good way of work, all of us working together. Um, and I can definitely say that I would say 80% of the people in the canteen would have not gone to the service centre. They would have not, they wouldn't have accessed that service. Um, so I just wanted to say a thank you for that. That was 
through me with my boiler house hat on and Caribbean's hat on, attending that offer to shadow to then turn into the council coming into the community. Um, so yeah, and if I know they attend other spaces, um, but yeah, the the, the Caribbean's the first Friday of every month, and I think we they agreed that the pilot would be for six months because I just think we need that amount of sort of six visits to be able to say, you know what, this has been worthwhile. I don't think we can do that after one visit, but even so, maybe we could because the money that's been generated or saved. I just want to share that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so that's so good. Um, and yeah, I'm, I mean, if you could work out a way of yeah calculating savings or you know the income max that's happened as a result, that would be that would be brilliant. Um, easier said than done, but that would be pretty cool. Just let me just say this quickly. The first when I first Zoe was in charge. And she's left now, so she was the man in charge. She was the manager, and I had had somebody who'd contacted the Money Hub, and they were complaining about how they'd been dealt with. And Zoe took that really seriously, and she looked into it. Then he was taken on as a as a case. He'd been fighting for his DLA for maybe a year, two years. The Money Hub supported him, went to court, and he was backdated over twenty two thousand pounds. So, I mean, it's just the, the amount of money that has been shared and, and, and got into the rights to the residents is unbelievable. Um, I'm maybe a bit biased, but um, I really like Money Hub for, my, for the people, yeah. No, that's great. It's fantastic to hear. I mean, that's 2022 grand is like life changing, isn't it? So that's amazing. Um, Charlie. I was just going to give some more context about how that shadowing kind of came about and just because I know we've got a few of our community infrastructure partners on the phone, on the call who are part of kind of 24 organizations that we grant, have grant funded over the last two years. That conversation about shadowing and bringing some community partners into Money Hub came from a kind of meeting around community infrastructure about how we need to kind of start to break down the relationships between community partners and the statutory sector. And kind of Zoe was up for trialing that. We'll just, I've, I've kind of we're seeing if we can do it again. I'm kind of I don't want to both of them. So it's all these kind of delicate things in the background. But this is that that was that's come from the kind of work and the lessons and the communications that you've all been giving us over the years too. So the reason why that was possible and how we've got there is through all the feedback you've been giving us through that grant and other conversations throughout the pandemic and up to now. So I just wanted to share that with you, you all, because it is that hard work that's been going in to create that opportunity. Yeah, amazing. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Jenny's just put in the chat, are there any other services that the residents at Carabooks or other organisations might need help to access support from? So, yeah, thinking beyond Money Hub, are there other services which that kind of relationship building or that kind of work together would be helpful? Um, uh, I'm just looking at you, put their hand up first. Um, Penny? Hi, uh, yeah, I mean... I didn't. I haven't got an answer to that question that you've just asked, but um, I'd love to shadow at some point if it's relevant, depending on what comes up next. So definitely put me on a list. I'd love to learn more about uh, anything that might help the beneficiaries. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Oh yeah, um, new service on a Friday evening for Idias. Uh, we've partnered with Stoke Newton Baptist Church, and that's from seven o'clock till eight on Stoke Newton Road. Um, so that's a new service where that we take the food to them. They've got like chefs and cooks there. And then it's a, a street service. So um, yeah, it's on the website as well. And I think I've got some on social media. So that's a new service for us. And then we've had a special invitation um, as part of, an, uh, for, I think it's a 30th anniversary for Fair Share. So they've invited us to the House of, House of Parliament on the 12th of June. Um, so as a guest and a speaker. Um, so Ina and myself will be joining them. It's not really my style, but I'll go along anyway. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that, that's good for idiots, and uh, hopefully it'll shine a bit of light on the impact that we're making about reducing obviously waste and surplus food in the community. So that's all good for us at the minute. Just thought I'd share the good news. Yeah, amazing. Thanks, Pat. You can report back at the next tool session on what's going on with the election as well after you've been part of it. Tell you the um, <laughs> uh Ali. Um, in answer to Jenny's question, um, some of the cantinas. Some of the things that they've requested is having um, basic health checks at the canteen. So that, and I, I kind of reached out to Charlie around that. Um, and that could be eye testing. Some people talked about, you know, checking the feet out and those kind of things. And we had a we had a, an in-depth conversation around that 
that could only ever be kind of like the first check maybe and um, to then maybe have to go to the doctors or for further checks but um i think it's a resource that um charlie put somebody in touch with me from the is it healthy liver van that everybody just finds funny whenever i say it i don't know why they just got a healthy liver van um, and that's hopefully going to come to the boiler house in the Thursday park up, outside. And it's those kind of things that like the first point of access. So anything around um, healthy checks um, would be would be helpful, Jenny. Nice one. Thanks, Ali. Um, just looking at the chat. Um, yeah, Penny, if you could share with me the info about the new service that you mentioned, then I can whack it in the newsletter, which will be going out probably early next week. Um, cool. Nice one. Thanks, Benny. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Ali? Sorry, I'm saying so much. I should, I should That's say right. it um, Next Thursday, we've got an open day at the Boiler House. Um, it's a get together and um, we're inviting people. I think I've sent an invite to quite a few people. But there's something that there's something else that we're going to be sharing on that day and i can't really say what it's going to be but it may be a benefit for people to test ideas out that's as much as i can say so if you know if you know anybody any residents in the surrounding area time to come along um to even if they just want to hear about like the journey the boiler has but there, there, there may be an opportunity to use the space that's what i'll say without telling you what and um, so yeah spread the word if you can Cool, sounds good. I'll put something in the newsletter as well, Ali, uh, about the open meeting, if that's all good. Cool. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to share? Questions, insights? Before we wrap up? No? Okay. Um, I was just going to say, um, there won't be another tool session until the 13th of June, just because we moved the one from that was going to be next week back to this week so um it'll be another three weeks now until the next one so yeah the next one's on the 13th of june you should, all your calendars if you've got it in there will reflect that but if it's not in your calendar and you usually just join via the link then just make a note it won't be till the 13th of june and i think that, that one we've got uh tracy's going to come along from uh shelter and we've got genevieve who's from uh, homelessness prevention at the council who usually comes to these meetings um, as well talking about um, let me just get up the floor plan to remind myself I think it's um, about women sleeping rough women sleeping rough census I believe um, so yeah two presentations that's on the 13th of June so yeah everyone always welcome as usual um, and yeah massive thanks to everyone for coming along today including John and Ben and Katie uh and you'll get the recording and the slides and everything in the newsletter so yeah we can wrap up there cheers everyone bye 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 thanks everyone thank you thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.